Welcome back to the Proverbial Life Podcast. So today we're going to continue our end time panel discussion. If you recall, the first pastor gave his presentation on premillennialism. We are now going into the Q&A section of the presentation. So he gave his presentation. Now everyone will have the opportunity to ask a question for a minute. This was my least favorite part, at least initially. I think I bombed it. I don't think I was ready. I know I wasn't ready. And not that I didn't come in prepared, but I just froze. I didn't have questions uh, prepared that I could have asked him. And I think as the panel discussion went on, I got much better in this area. But initially, uh, I didn't do too well. So let's just review this. I I asked a good question, but I didn't have good follow-up questions. Let's listen up and we'll continue with the panel discussion. Uh, so you said you hold to a literal translation of the scriptures. Okay, so literal to what point? Because when you, when Jesus, for example, in the book of Revelation, it says that there's uh, sores that come out of his mouth. Is that literal? Okay, so that was a good question. That's that's a good question. There were some other questions I could have asked. Uh, I could have, I mean, even even as question concerning the book of uh, Matthew, Matthew 24. What's your what's your understanding of Matthew 24? Jesus li- is literally addressing that section to that generation, right? You, 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 this generation. Do you take that literally? I could have gone in different directions and I didn't, but let me hear his response. Listen to this. No, no, it's not. I will say that's not. Okay. So then it's not always literal. No, there is some figurative. If, if plain sense doesn't make sense, that's when we have to seek other sense. And that was his mantra. If plain sense doesn't make sense, that's when we have to seek other sense. Now, the thing with that is, who's the one who determines the rules? It's the interpreter. To, to, to a degree, we, we have to be able to determine what is figurative and what isn't figurative. But the irony in this is that for the person who is the literalist, right, and he makes this huge argument about the, the scriptures needing to be read literally, he's not being consistent with his position. And, 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 I, and I believe the scriptures should be read literally as well, but depending on its genre. So, for example, in the book of Revelation, he'll say that there are some things that shouldn't be read literally. They should be read figuratively. Well, why? Well, because it's an apocalyptic literature, right? So... In this uh, highly visionary uh, apocalyptic writing, you need to take into consideration the imagery that's used from the writer and what he's pulling from, in this case, the Old Testament, and how he's applying those Old Testament pictures to New Testament reality with the audience that John is writing to in the book of Revelation. So th- that's that's the premise from which I come from. Well, he's coming from a premise of you know, you get to arbitrarily define uh, what is uh, literal and what is figurative based on whether or not it makes common sense. Well, you ask 10 premillennial dispensationalists if, if they think that that makes sense. And some would say, well, in, in, in the book of Revelation, for example, there's there's going to be blood that comes to people's waist. Was They believe that that's literal. And then they'll take the swords coming out of the mouth quite figuratively. And so you can't be squishy with this. If you're going to be a literalist, then literally be a literalist. But if you're, if you're going to pick and choose what it is that is literal based on your kind of uh, arbitrary determination. So when it says the swords come out of his mouth, we know that that's not literal. How? Why? Why? How do you know? On, on, on what basis? On what basis can you say you know for certain that that's not literal based on the premise that you believe everything should be read literally, right? You you said the scriptures are um, the, 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 the word of God, and I agree that they should be taken literally. I agree. However, they should be taken literally based on the genre of scripture. We know that that's a figure of speech, okay. right? Okay. okay. See right there, he got me. That was a follow up question right there, right there. Yeah, twenty, 20 seconds. Twenty seconds. Okay. Um, and right there, I was like, ah, I got twenty seconds. Man, I didn't have a backup question. Okay. Well, that was my other question. There's so many. Ah. Um. Okay. How how would you? Def- and in his face, he's like, "Yep, Ricky," <laughs> and he's right. This is my first time doing this. I'll be ready for the next time. Fine, literal. Let's just do that. So my question was, how do you define literal? Plain sense makes sense. We don't seek any other sense. 
It's when plain sense doesn't make sense that we have to dig in and we have to start looking at it different. Yeah, that was bad. It wasn't a bad question. There just needed to be more. I missed an opportunity. And that's okay. You're going to miss opportunities. But I'm just pointing out the opportunity I missed. Uh, yeah, so, Bob, I think I'll talk about this a little bit at, at the end because uh, you laid the foundation so well for a premillennial view. I don't know if we made it clear. I'm representing here a historical premill position. So I like um, Bob will be uh, – we'll, we'll agree on a lot, let's put it that way, as far as uh, the, the millennium goes. But where we'll primarily disagree is uh, the literal interpretation a little bit. I would prefer to um, – I would prefer to refer to refer to authorial intent there, especially when regarding prophecy. Uh, you know, uh, often we can talk about plain sense to whom, you know, to who was it plain to? Was it plain to the original hearers, which most of my dispensational profs when I was in school, they would point to that. I would point to uh, the, author, the author. What did the author intend to communicate? The author primarily being the Holy Spirit. First Peter tells us that the um the prophets searched their own writings looking to find out uh what god was communicating through them right so that's a good good point um good good uh good interjection there right a plain to who right so you, so we're looking at it with, with western eyes and we're looking at it um in 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 our time and we're saying oh uh plain sense means this well is that what that meant to the writer is that how it would have been understood by the readers? So, so is this what I mean? It's quite arrogant for us to come in and, and now impose a meaning that is foreign to the original receivers of the text. That is the problem. So I think that would lead to the other differences that we have. Eric, one minute response. This is the other thing that, I don't know, I thought this was a and a time, right? <laughs> um, People are interjecting with their disagreements without asking questions. And I probably I should have picked up on that sooner because it kept happening. Uh, but I just refuse to do that. If, if it's a Q&A time, let me ask my questions. Uh, but but I noticed that these guys were and then again, this is new to me. So I'm, I've, I've learned and I'm learning uh, and it may may look different at another time. But uh, that was something that irked me. I was like, come on. Though we're asking questions here, not interjecting our position or our disagreement. And the Amil guy did that a lot, but let's listen in. I'll ask this in the form of a question. It has to do with the distinction between Israel and the church. Uh, baked in to your position is a distinction, not just historical, but one that extends on into the future. How far does that go into the future? And what do you do with passages like Ephesians 2, where uh, Paul not just suggests, but says uh, these two groups have become one, uh, one new people. Uh, what, how, how do you do that? How do you make sense of that? Right. That's a good question. Very good question. So what do you do with Israel, the distinction between Israel and the church? And that's what uh, premillennial dispensationalists do. They make a, a sharp distinction between the people of God in the Old Covenant and the people of God in the New Covenant, and they and, and even just ethnic Israel, ethnic Jews. They say that the ethnic Jews uh, have promises that are specific to them and that those promises aren't um, for uh, the people of God in the New Covenant, and they make this sharp uh, uh, distinction between Israel and the church. So let's listen into his response. Okay, so during during the church age that we're in, we are one people. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we're united together as one people. So if you know of a Messianic Jew, he's your brother because he believes in Jesus. Okay. That's how we become one people during the church age. But I think there's a complete separate distinction. If you go into Revelation and you start into Revelation, why is the church mentioned in the first three chapters and never again mentioned in the next 19 chapters? So why is the church mentioned in the first three chapters and never again mentioned in the next chapter? Again, 
um, th- this is th- and this is his position. It's a futurism, right? So he's assuming that when John is writing to his audience, that John is talking to the future, and he is. John is talking to their future, not our future, and that's an important distinction. When you read the Book of Revelation, notice first person usage of word. Notice uh, geographical usage, right? Um, these these things uh, and and time usage, right? I'm writing to you. These things will take place shortly. The time is near. The time is at hand. Um, he he's also going on to say, uh, if you're pregnant with child, um, make sure that this day doesn't come, right? Or or go to the housetop, or or come, excuse me, come down from the housetop and flee to the mountains, right? Woe woe to you if you're pregnant during this time. What is he talking about? He's talking about the impending judgment that's coming in the first century, 70 AD, in Jerusalem to destroy the fabric of the religious system uh, that the the Jews had with the temple. The ability they had to um, make sacrifices and worship their God in the temple was coming to an end. And so that is an important distinction that has been missed and is being missed. And I believe that's because we're gone. We're not. So, so apparently after Revelation 3, the church is raptured. Nowhere do the scriptures teach of a secret rapture. There's one general return of Christ. And there is a rapture, but it's at the end of time. There isn't, there isn't going to be, you know, we're going to go through this uh, persecution and suffering. And right before the wrath of God is poured out, the church is going to be sucked out. No, nowhere. Nowhere in scripture is that taught. Nowhere. But. This is, and so when you take that away, uh, th- then then everything else that you're saying, that your your theology crumbles. Okay, your understanding of end times crumbles when you take away these major pieces that are not found in Scripture. Here, so there is absolutely a distinction between the church and Israel. Those promises that God made to the church, He intends on keeping. The, the promises that he's made to Israel, he intends on keeping. God cannot break his word. Yeah, he doesn't break his word. He fulfills his word. So in the Old Covenant, you have promises made to the assembly of God, to the people of God, to the church of God. Right? You, 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 you have uh, promises that are intended for God's children, and those same promises are fulfilled in the New Covenant fulfilled in Christ and applied to the people of God. And so, for example, in the Old Covenant, there was this initial land promise. Well, there's a fulfillment of the land promise. It's not just merely the land. It's the whole earth, right? The whole earth is ours in Christ, not just the geographical location. And so you have this um, progressive revelation, the initial uh, giving of a promise of the giving of the land, the people of God fail in obeying God and doing what he has called them to do and, and to conquer the land. And so Christ comes as the conqueror, the greater Joshua, and he defeats death, right? He rises from the grave on earth. He rises from the dead. And now he tells the disciples, go make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples of the nations, of all nations. All this is yours. This is this is what I want for you. Now go forward and conquer it because it has been conquered. That's that's an important. There's no distinction between Israel and the church. And Bob, you got two, three more minutes if you like. Really? Continue on, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's huge. When we start blending the two, the church and Israel together. And we start saying uh, those promises that God made to Israel now apply to the church. I think we can get into some really dangerous places. Well, again, they're fulfilled in the new covenant. So, so right. We're, we're, we're children, we're children of Abraham, father Abraham. Okay. So, so what did God promise Abraham? God promised Abraham the earth, right? He promised him the earth. And that promise was not only uh, to, to uh, us, but it was also to our children. And so, so we, we have to read the Bible a, as a whole and not just these small segments. 
and 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 make sharp divisions between um you know Israel and the church it's the people of God and and again Ephesians 2 we see this or or uh, Romans 11 right we see the olive tree that we are grafted in that was the plan of God that was the mystery of Christ from all eternity is that that the Gentiles would be grafted in that was the purpose of sending out Jonah Jonah uh preach to these Ninevites, right? And, and Jonah didn't want to do it because he knew God was gracious and God was going to save them. That's why he didn't want to do it. Jonah was upset that God was so gracious to save even wicked Ninevites. Well, that was the plan of God for all time, is that the Jew and the Gentile would be one people, one. And so the promises that God initiates with Israel is a gracious promise that Christ fulfills uh, in himself, in types and shadows in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system. And those were all pointing to the greater reality in Christ. And so now that we have the fullness of the covenant revealed to us in Christ and the satisfaction of his perfect righteousness, those promises are fulfilled in him. So there is no distinction between the church and Israel. Really, thank you. The Abrahamic covenant, does that apply to Christians? This was, this was horrible. <laughs> Listen to this. No, it doesn't. Not at this point, it doesn't. Wow. Okay. The Abrahamic covenant does not apply to the Christian, not at this point. What? Oh, what does Romans 4, 5, and 6 say? Specifically, uh, well, actually, 3, 4, wait, 3, 4, 4 and 5. Yes, yes, that promise is for us. What are you talking about? But we are the bride of Christ. There's a difference between the bride and Israel. Israel is not the bride of Christ today. There's a <laughs> then they're not united, right? 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 Then, then Ephesians 2 doesn't matter. Then the, then, then the wall of partition hasn't been torn down. Again, uh, even even Galatians, right, um, where it talks about um, the Israel of God. And speaking of speaking to the Gentiles, the Israel of God, right? So, so those who have been grafted into Christ are Israel of God. The, we we are spiritual Jews, and that that's not that's not spiritualizing anything. That that, that that's taking the whole of God's revelation and applying it across the board, applying it properly different program laid out god so has why, a different program laid out i why in the beginning of revelation do we hear all about the church and then all of a sudden in chapter three we don't hear anything more about the church at the end of chapter three it's that's a weak argument because the program has changed we're into a different dispensation no john is thinking to himself i didn't say that <laughs> John, John is like, uh, I don't know where he's getting that from because that's not what I was communicating in my writing on the book of Revelation. Okay, and I believe that that's, that, this, that distinction is huge. A lot of people out there saying that we're the same. We're not the same. Okay. You got another two minutes if you like. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right, y'all, we're going to stop here because after this is my presentation on postmillennialism, followed by the presentation on historic pre mill So I'd like to keep these as short as possible. So if you like this video, please like it, share it. And I will, for those of you who asked, try to get the link. Um, right now it's unlisted by the person who has it on their channel. So I'll speak to them, get the video unlocked so that you all can see it and view the whole discussion in its entirety. Thank you for watching. Would love to hear your interactions based off this video and look forward to seeing you next time as we think through the post-millennial perspective given my presentation. All right, y'all. Grace and peace.